Right, so what I'm going to talk about today is under the topic of Forstbundung Technik. Uh, and this uh, German title, which I'm sure you all know means Progress Through Technology, applies uh, to a very exciting project I was involved in uh, over the last couple of months, uh, the, what we call open source genomics of the German E. coli outbreak. Now, I'm sure that many of those words will be unfamiliar to you, so we're going to go through those uh, uh, in the talk and explain it. Uh, in more detail. Let's start with the question, what's E. coli? Well, this bacterium was first called Bacteria coli communis and isolated from babies' nappies by this guy here, this German-Austrian physician, Theodor Escherich. Um, and he did that in 1885. In 1919, uh, the species was renamed in his honour as Escherichia coli. Um, and we abbreviate that as E. coli. Uh, in, the, in the jargon. Bit of audience participation. How many of you think you're carrying E. coli at the moment? Put your hands up if you think you're carrying E. coli. Many of you are right. There's probably about half, three quarters of you think you're carrying it. In fact, probably 90% of you, any of you who take antibiotics might not be, but everyone else will be carrying E. coli. 100% of individuals normally would be carrying E. coli. So that may seem a bit strange to you because you think of E. coli as something horrible that you hear about in the news. In fact, this is a very versatile bacterium. In fact, it is what, what we call uh, biology's premier model organism. We know more about this particular bacterium than we know about any other organism. Even the human genome and human physiology and so forth haven't been studied quite as, in quite as much detail as E. coli. Um, it is what we call a gut commensal, which means it lives in the gut of animals, of mammals particularly, not causing any problem, just lives there. There are thousands of species that live in your, in your gut, and this is one of them. From kangaroos to cattle, anywhere you look, you'll find E. coli. E. coli has uh, been reborn in the last uh, quarter century or so as biotechnology's main workhorse. So people use E. coli to make things. So diabetics use insulin. That insulin is now made in E. coli through what we call genetic engineering or recombinant DNA technology. It's also used as what we call a probiotic, uh, a friendly bacterium, uh, which is so people get fed harmless strains of E. coli to try and prevent them from getting uh, harmful infections. Uh, and there is some body of evidence that suggests that that approach does work. If you're interested to read more, uh, there's a very good book by a Facebook friend of mine. I've never met him in real life, but met, uh, spoke to him a lot on Facebook and elsewhere. Carl Zimmer has written about this uh, and, and the role of E. coli, the central role of E. coli in modern science. Just a couple of quotes there to, to ram home the point. Uh, Fred Neidhart uh, said all cell biologists have at least two cells of interest. The one they're studying and E. coli because we just use E. coli as the reference uh, for everything we, we do in terms of understanding how cells work. And similarly, um, French uh, scientist here, Jacques Monod, uh, said what is true of E. coli is also true of the elephant, making the point that if we understand how the E. coli cell works, we understand how everything works. We want to understand how proteins are made in E. coli. Once we've achieved that, we can extrapolate that information to how the same thing works in, say, the elephant or in humans, uh, for that matter. The problem is that it's not just a versatile bacterium, it's a versatile pathogen. We use the term pathogen for any microorganism that can cause disease. And this bacterium can cause disease. It's got uh, many different target organisms that will infect many different organ systems. So in piglets, you get what they call weanling diarrhea. Birds, they get an infection of the bloodstream called colibacillosis. In humans, you can get infections of the gut, of which there are many different sorts. Uh, any, any of you who've had a, a, a urinary tract infection, had cystitis, that will almost certainly have been due to E. coli. It can infect the bloodstream in some patients, uh, and it can cause meningitis. And the focus of this talk is on the kinds that cause gut infections, and there are lots of long names to describe the varieties of E. coli that cause gut infection. And the point of putting that up is just to show you how versatile this organism is. It's not just doing things in one way. It has many different ways to make you sick. Focus on one particular uh, problem that's caused by E. coli. This is something called hemolytic uremic syndrome, or HUS. 
Uh, it's a bit of a mouthful, but um, this is the result of infection with one particular variety of E. coli called sugar toxin producing E. coli, or STEC. Um, and this here is a molecular model of the sugar toxin. It's actually in two, two kind of modules. There's this part here, the active part goes in and damages cells. And then there's this part here which is involved in delivering uh, that active part to the cells by binding to the cells and, and, and docking with them. The consequences of the, of the release of this toxin by the E. coli, releases it from the gut, but the toxin diffuses out through the rest of the body, is that you get bloody diarrhea, uh, you get damage to the kidneys and to the brain, uh, the patients become anemic, and they also lose these other cells in the blood, uh, the platelets, and so they become more susceptible to, uh, to bleeding. And so this is a big problem. Quickly, a little sidestep to talk about genomes. Now, I throw around the, the word genome freely because I'm used to it. I know that you're not used to it, and it's hard to explain what a genome is in two minutes. Um, if you like, the genome is the recipe book for the cell, and it's written in these four characters, these four letters, A, C's, T's, and G's, as a string of those characters in the DNA molecule. And when we sequence a genome, what we're doing is we're turning something material, that DNA molecule, uh, into something digital, into a DNA sequence on our computers. And if you want an analogy, it's a bit like taking a book and scanning that book on a scanner and then using some optical character recognition software to actually turn that into digital information. So you can take a book, which is a physical object, and, uh, uh, and scan it and produce a digital uh, entity. And this, we do the same thing when we sequence the genome. We're basically taking that material, the DNA, and extracting the digital information, which gives us the recipe book for that particular cell. Another little aside, just to give some um, context, uh, the way science is, is usually working is um, illustrated by these two quotes here. Uh, Thomas Edison said, 1% perspiration, 99% uh, one percent inspiration, ninety-nine percent perspiration. I'd argue that actually success in in, in the modern uh, world of science is actually, particularly in the laboratory sciences, is much dependent on instrumentation uh, uh, rather than inspiration or pers perspiration. If you have the latest equipment, the most sensitive uh, equipment available to you, the, the, the most efficient equipment, then you can do more than anyone else around the world. You can get to the, the top of the queue, if you like, in terms of success. There's another quote here, work, finish, publish, from, from Davy, Humphrey Davy. Most scientists, they work in their own group, in their own labs, their lab, their lab notebooks to themselves. They keep it all secret uh, uh, until the work is actually published. And it's only when the work is published in a journal that the rest of the world knows that that person's even working in that area. And that's the usual way that science is done. There's a degree of secrecy until publication comes about. Now, DNA sequencing, genome sequencing in Birmingham, we've been doing this for several years now. Uh, we're pretty geeky, I have to say. My bioinformatician, Nick Lohman, and myself, we run a blog. And here is Nick's uh, entry for the blog on August the 6th, 2009, where he says he's anticipating like a kid waiting for Santa Claus at that particular day, because that was the day in which our first uh, genome sequencer was delivered. Uh, here it is in a big crate here. Uh, Nick took these pictures and put them on the blog. He's that geeky that he likes taking pictures of sequences. Here's my colleague Charles Penn looking a bit of a lemon standing next to it. Uh, but we were very excited when this instrument arrived back then in 2009. Uh, and since then we've run it dozens of times and actually sequenced uh, many, many genomes, bacterial genomes with it. Things got a bit more interesting in February this year when actually uh, this is my blog posting on the blog where I actually won uh, one of the most recent uh, instruments in a competition. So the manufacturers wanted to release this instrument in Europe, and they said, well, they'll give away two instruments to anyone who can make up a good story for why they should have the instrument and what they're going to do with it and, and how they're going to capitalize on it. So I was one of two winners out of 150 entries to win this instrument, um, and we were very pleased to get it. Uh, and we. We got the, the, this iron torrent. I went to, to Switzerland to kind of collect the prize, and then the actual instrument itself was delivered uh, a, a month or so later. This iron torrent instrument uh, is uh, very uh, kind of very interesting. It's very new and snazzy. 
It's very compact. It's about the size of uh, not even a laser printer, really, more like a kind of inkjet printer in terms of its size and bench uh, footprint. Uh, they've, they've done a few things which are a little bit kind of, you, you could say they're a bit cheesy or you could say they're a bit cool. They've, they've put kind of PlayStation symbols on the front here. They put a little dock there for you to stick your iPod in. Uh, when I first saw that, I thought, well, maybe you actually control it with the iPod or something. They said, oh, no, we just put the dock on so, and give people an iPod just for a bit of fun. Uh, the instrument itself runs these little chips. These chips about the size, this is blown up massively, it's about the size of a postage stamp. Um, and on those, uh, there are millions of wells which read sequences uh, from millions of molecules in a single run. A single run takes about three hours. Um, and within the microchip, there, uh, there, are, there is a kind of pH meter, massively parallel pH meter, that detects the release of protons during the sequencing reaction. And that's this kind of smart new chemistry that this system uses uh, to detect the sequences. And it's costing about £500 to do a run uh, on this instrument. Now let's get back to E. coli. So in Germany, uh, in May, uh, June particularly, and a little bit in July as well of this year, uh, there was this massive outbreak of a particular kind of E. coli called E. coli 0104H4. Um, this map here, the darker blue shows the, where there are the, the most cases. You can see most of the cases up there in, in northern Germany. Uh, but cases were scattered around through the rest of Germany, and there were cases in other countries from people who'd been to Germany and then were returning to their home country. So we saw, I think, five cases here in the UK. For over 4,000 cases, over 40 deaths as a result of this outbreak. There was a, an epidemiological link to sprouting seeds. There was some few false starts. Initially, cucumbers were blamed, but then it now appears that, that fenugreek seeds, particularly, uh, and sprouts derived from them were the source of this. One of the distinguishing characteristics of this outbreak was that it was a very high risk of hemolytic uremic syndrome in patients who had this uh, infection, uh, much higher than we'd normally expect to see, uh, over 25%. And also, females seemed particularly at risk. Uh, so of the, all the cases, about 55% were female. And of those that had hemolytic uremic syndrome, over 60% were female. Still not really understood uh, why that's the case. One possible explanation is that real men don't eat bean sprouts and that perhaps it was the fact that the women were going to the salad while the men were eating all the, the meat. I, I'm not sure, but th we haven't got to the bottom of that yet. This just uh, shows you the, the, the kind of extent of the outbreak over time. Uh, it kind of peaked here around the May the 20th. Um, at that stage, hundreds of cases, over 200 cases per, per, uh, per day. Um, and it's, it's just hard to imagine the effect of this on the German hospitals, on the German public in general, uh, in, in those areas that were affected. Uh, we have established a link uh, with people in Hamburg, and they've told us just how terrible it was. That just They, they ran out of bedpans, they, they couldn't find space, they had to open up new wards uh, temp in temporary buildings. Uh, it was just absolutely a uh, dreadful uh, event. And in fact, here is our collaborator here, Dr. Holger Roder, at, uh, who works here at the Universitätsklinikum in Hamburg, Eppendorf. And he was at the centre of this outbreak uh, towards the end of May. He's a bacteriologist. Uh, he's a doctor. He's not a genome scientist. And he didn't really know much about E. coli. So he was thinking to himself, what was he going to do? Well, any of you here who are sort of maybe 40 years old, or older, will know exactly what you do in that situation. You call International Rescue. And when you call International Rescue, what happens? Well, we all know what happens, don't we? Five, four, three, two, one. In fact, it wasn't quite that dramatic, but he, he did actually call on the international community for help, and he received help in a very dramatic way. And, and what happened later was very exciting. So a Chinese uh, postdoc in, in, in uh, that uh, university actually suggested, why not send some of the DNA from one of these E. coli's uh, to the Chinese Genomics Institute, BGI in Shenzhen, uh, and ask them to sequence it. So they made contact, and the BGI said, yeah, we'll sequence it. 
So they didn't use Thunderbird 2, they used conventional approaches, but they sent that DNA to, to uh, China. And it so happens that the group in China, that, that institute in China, had just bought their own iron torrent as well. They had to buy theirs, they didn't win it in the competition, but they bought one. Uh, and they sequenced the DNA um, very quickly uh, from that uh, uh, genome, for, uh, attained uh, sequences for, from that uh, particular E. coli. And then they did something quite inspired. Because I say, normally people keep everything secret when they're working on things uh, until they're ready to publish. But what the Chinese did was they immediately released the genome sequence into the public domain. They put it on the internet and they said to anyone, have a look at this, see what you can do with it. Um, and that's where my bioinformatician, Nick Lohman, here, came into the picture. He uh, was at a, a bioinformatics conference at the time, and, and he noticed that this uh, data had just been released. He had actually geared up, because we just got our own iron torrent, he geared up and made himself ready to analyze iron torrent data. So he was one of the few people in the world that was poised to analyze this kind of data. And so he did. He, he did what we call an assembly, where you put the various pieces of a jigsaw puzzle together, the various bits of DNA uh, uh, together to create something like a draft of the genome sequence. And then he released that back into the uh, public domain, as it says here, um, and asked other people to look at that. He said, why don't we just have a crowdsource analysis of this? Just get anyone who wants to look at this stuff, let's see what we can do. And issuing that kind of call to arms, uh, Brought, some, brought forth something quite remarkable. Within 24 hours of its release, as I say, Nick had assembled the genome. Within two days, people had assigned it to an existing lineage. Within five days, a diagnostic test was created and released. And within a week, over two dozen reports had been posted on, on this uh, kind of open source website, a wiki uh, des describing this particular strain. So things, uh, as soon as Nick, uh, Put up his assembly. This guy here who goes by the pseudonym of Mike the Mad Biologist when he blogs, but his real name is Mike Feldgarten. Uh, he was in the US and he said, looked at, our, at the data that Nick had released, did some of his own analysis and said, ah, hang on, this E. coli strain, everyone's saying, oh, it's new, we don't know what it is. Actually, it's very similar to something that was seen in Germany 10 years ago. So it's not quite as new as people think. Um, and um, we, we, you know, that was the, the start of, uh, of a bigger analysis where so all around the world in, in, in four continents people started looking at this data, playing with it, analyzing it uh, in, the, in the days that followed. The US, and, uh, so David Studholm in, in University of Exeter, he was able to, to show that it was, um, that there was another closely related strain, um, Marina Manriquez in Spain, she did a lot of work setting up with the, the wiki and so forth. Kat Holt uh, in Australia uh, did a lot of analysis about the biology of the organism. And there were people in Hong Kong in the universities there actually looking at the data, people in BGI as well also analyzing the data. So there's this mass massive international effort. Okay, it wasn't Thunderbirds Argo, but nonetheless it was quite a striking international collaboration jump-started by the BGI's release of data and Nick Lohman's uh, call to, to arms and, and call to people to do it. So uh, here's you can't read this, but it just gives you the scale of with, from the 2nd of June when Nick said, yeah, here's the assembly, down to the 16th of June. You can just see all these people from around the world coming together uh, and commenting and working on it. And social media were used quite extensively. Twitter was used, certainly in the early days, uh, to communicate the fact, oh, I've just done this new piece of analysis, have a look at this, and so forth. Uh, and blogging as well, people using their own blogs uh, to communicate this stuff. This got actually a lot of coverage in the conventional scientific press. Uh, news blog from Nature magazine covered it. It actually appeared in the print version of Science magazine. Uh, here's another uh, blog here uh, describing these the, this, the so-called crowdsourced uh, uh, sequencing uh, uh, analysis efforts. So what did we learn from all that? A number of takeaway messages. Pathogens don't bother with passports. As I said, it's not a new strain. It was seen something similar seen in Germany 10 years before. But curiously, uh, I think it was in 2004, there was a similar strain in Korea as well. 
uh, David Studholm showed that the closest strain that had already been genome sequenced was actually from uh, a patient, an HIV positive patient from the Central African Republic in the late 1990s. Uh, so these strains are moving around, they're not respecting international borders uh, at all. Um, this German STEC strain comes from a lineage, also, this was something that was unexpected, comes from a lineage of E. coli that circulates in the human population. Normally when we see these outbreaks of hemolytic uremic syndrome, they're associated with an animal source, and particularly cows. So it, it's, it's the, 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 there are lineages that live in the cow intestine, get into cow pats, get into the human food chain. That wasn't the case for this lineage. So that changed people's thinking, and it was really quite surprising. We didn't really expect that at all. It's clear that bacteria evolve very quickly. So in... To create this strain, virulence factors, the things that cause disease, were able to jump from one kind of E. coli to another kind of E. coli quite quickly, and they move around on bacterial viruses. So it's a bit odd to think about it, but bacteria have their own viruses that can jump in and out of their cells and in and out of their genomes, and they carry, can carry e extra genes with them that give those, those bacteria new properties like virulence. Another worrying thing was that this strain seen in Germany was antibiotic resistant, even though none of the patients had received antibiotics before uh, the outbreak started. Uh, in fact, you wouldn't normally use antibiotics in this kind of outbreak, but nonetheless, when you did the test in the lab, it was antibiotic resistant. And it's clear, I think, what the major take-home message is, even, you know, we think of Germany as one of the most advanced societies on the planet, and yet German society is just as vulnerable to the threat of infection uh, as anywhere else. It's still a big problem. And we can't say that infection is no longer a problem and we should concentrate purely on cancer and aging and so forth. Infection is still out there. We termed this uh, phenomenon that, that we jump started open source genomics. And what we saw was this high throughput sequencing using this very up to date modern instrument. We saw these crowdsourced analyses. Many of the people doing this work, most of the people doing this work, were not paid as public health microbiologists. They were bioinformaticians who were just interested to help and interested to take on the intellectual challenge uh, and do something that might be of use. There's also very important, as I say, the BGI very inspired in having this liberal approach to data release, putting the data out there straight away. In fact, they put a Creative Commons license on the data uh, to say, you know, you can do what you like with this data as long as you credit us uh, if, if you do anything with it. Um, and it's clear that social media, blogging, Twitter and so forth can augment the usual channels of academic discourse. So you think academics, all they do is they sit in libraries with dusty old books and they publish in journals and so forth. Well, it's not true. They are actually in, in, engaging uh, in, in lots of discussions through these, these kind of social media. And it seems that it is useful. I mean, we have the same issues, I have the same issues at home with my children. Why are you spending so much time on Facebook? Should be doing your homework. And then she comes back and says, I'm actually talking to my friends about how to do the homework using Facebook, Dad. So get off my back. It's, just, it's, in, it's interesting the way we're changing our views on this. Have we broken the mould? Uh, are we going to see this as the normal way of doing science? I don't think so. I think it will be appropriate for public health emergencies in the future where the next time we get pandemic flu or something like that, this will be the way it will be done. But I suspect most of ordinary science will continue in a particular groove, the same groove it's in, been in for, for decades or, or, or longer. Some people have said that there is this kind of uh, quandary now, you know, site or site. You actually uh, produce papers in traditional journals and cite other papers in traditional journals. Or do you actually publish outside of that on blogs uh, and, and using other media to communicate things? Uh, and there's a lively discussion about that and about how important it is to publish in peer-reviewed journals and how much you should be using these other approaches. It's clear that genome sequencing in this outbreak it, it, it illustrated the advantages of open-endedness. So you can sequence a genome. You don't know what you're going to get out of it. If you just set up a bar barrage of tests it, for individual genes, you're only going to find what you're looking for. Whereas if you sequence a genome, you find out all sorts of unknown unknowns. It works for any bacterium, any virus. It's ultimate in resolution. And these new benchtop sequencing platforms, like IonTorrent, 
can now generate data quickly enough for actually to have an influence in real time uh, on, a, on an outbreak and understanding an outbreak. So, a couple more, a few more takeaway messages. The, uh, are we ready for the next outbreak? Well, it's a struggle. The wisdom of the crowd, the, 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 the global mass of human intelligence versus the mutability of the microbial masses. Uh, these bacteria do evolve very quickly, viruses evolve very quickly, but I like to think we'll be ready next time, particularly if we can harness uh, the kind of swarm brain from around the world. Knowledge is power, uh, and this, uh, in, in homage to our, I should say, four-sprung, ah, oh, misspelled, four-sprung uh, uh progress through technology. If we didn't have the iron torrent, if we didn't have the internet, we couldn't have done this kind of stuff. We actually squared the circle here. With, when Nick first presented this to me, he's, I said, all this twittering and blogging and stuff, it's all just froth. You should be writing peer-reviewed pa papers, in, or we've published in peer-reviewed journals, uh, high impact with high impact factors. That's what you're paid to do. Stop mucking about with all this. And he said, oh, you're a grumpy old man, aren't you? And, and I said, all right, well, let's see if we can write it up. And we did write it up with the Germans and with the Chinese and some of those crowdsourcing people. And we actually managed to get ourselves into the New England Journal of Medicine, which is the probably was well, the highest impact factor journal uh, of any journal. So we were very pleased that we managed to have all this excitement with the crowdsourcing and actually distill it down into a paper. We went to, to Germany a, a couple of weeks ago, and here's myself and Nick Lohman uh, drinking with our German collaborators. Uh, last week, there was another, I should say there were three other genome sequencing efforts on this strain. Uh, and one of them was published back to back with us in the New England Journal. And this is Dave Rasco, who was uh, the lead author on that paper. And we shared some champagne with him also last week to celebrate the fact that we both got into the New England Journal. I've more or less finished now. I just, as we're in Birmingham, though, I'll leave you with one last quote, which is a quote from Joseph Priestley talking about the Lunar Society of Birmingham, which is a group of intellectuals, businessmen, uh, doctors, scientists coming together. Uh, uh, on the night of the full moon for many years and discussing all the advances of the Enlightenment, uh, of the Industrial Revolution and so forth. And here was, here was his uh, statement on, on, on uh, what, they, what that Lunar Society was all about. We were united by a common love of science which we thought sufficient to bring together persons of all distinctions, Christians, Jews, Muslims and heathens, monarchists and republicans. And I'd like to think the spirit of the Lunar Society lives on in this effort that we've uh, we've been doing over the last couple of months. Thank you. That's me finished.